This is a general session on finding common ground and the common good on religious liberty and LGBTQ rights. Uh, we have four speakers. I'm going to introduce them all now, and then we'll give each uh, an opportunity to speak. Uh, I've asked them to speak each for as long as they like, uh, but in no event longer than 15 minutes. And uh, we will begin by hearing from uh, Shapri Lomaglio, who is the Vice President for Government Relations and Executive Programs at the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities, and a return participant here at the Religious Freedom Annual Review. Uh, thank you, uh, Shapri, for being here. She helps uh, respond to legislative, legal, and regulatory matters on behalf of member institutions. Uh, she is a graduate of Gordon College and in law from the University of Arizona. She served as a legal fellow in the U.S. Senate and is now on the board of trustees of Gordon College. Uh, she is also a deaconess at Grace Meridian Hill Presbyterian Church in Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, after Shapri, we will hear from Tyler Deaton, who is president of Allegiance Strategies. This is a D.C.-based public affairs consulting firm that helps clients build a freer, safer, and stronger world. He has worked in bipartisan advocacy on a variety of topics, including religious freedom, health care, immigration, criminal justice, transportation, and education. His work often involves advocating for LGBTQ rights and equality with an emphasis on engaging with conservatives. Uh, not sure if he'll find any of those here. <laughs> uh, then, we'll hear, <laughs> then we'll hear from uh, Professor William Eskridge, Jr., the John A. Garber Professor of Jurisprudence at the World's Best Law School. This is an inside joke because I am a graduate of Yale Law School. Uh, he is the author of the leading casebook on legislation and regulation. I know that because I teach from it each year. Uh, prior to joining Yale Law School, Professor Eskridge was a professor at Georgetown, the country's best undergraduate university, for anyone wondering. And over the past several decades, he has been one of the country's leading advocates of LGBTQ rights and of gay marriage, and an advocate for all-around decency, including finding compromise and common ground between religion and religious freedom and gay rights. Some of you may know Lynn Wardle, who just retired from BYU Law School, who is a tireless advocate of traditional definitions of marriage. And Professor Eskridge and Professor Wardle were so often paired as debate participants that someone referred to them as the Legal Academy's leading same-sex couple. <laughs> Uh, finally, we will hear from uh, Thomas Berg, uh, the James L. Oberstar Professor of Law and Public Policy at the University of St. Thomas School of Law. Professor Berg is one of the leading experts in our country on law and religion. Uh, he is currently working on a book provisionally titled Protecting Religious Liberty in a Polarized Age. He has his law degree from the University of Chicago, where our founding dean, Rex E. Lee, was a student and was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University, the other world's greatest university. <laughs> so let us proceed in that order, and uh, let me turn the microphone to you, Shapri. Thank you, Brett. Thank you for having me back again this year, and it's such an honor to be with all of you here today, um, and especially to be with these esteemed colleagues here on this panel talking about this very important topic. Um, I thought it might be helpful for just a moment or two if I told you how the CCCU um, came to be involved in the conversations around Fairness for All because they start here in this very state um, when in 2015 we observed um, uh, the leadership here uh, of the Church of Latter-day Saints and, and the, the political leadership here in the state and the leadership for the LGBT rights community come together and um, pass you know, the Utah Compromise, as it was known at the time. And we observed this during a time in 2015 when Christian colleges and universities were very um, in the midst of conflict around Title IX and the Title IX exception, and particularly in spaces for gender identity as well as some others. Um, 
Gordon College had had its accreditation challenged by its accreditor the year before. Um, and many other uh, challenges were arising, as in, including in California specifically, where state funding for, um, for uh, students to use their Cal grants to go to uh, private colleges in California was um, contemplating being removed from the faith-based um, institution space. So we were in the middle of all of this and we watched what you all did here in Utah and it was such an impressive and encouraging model for what possibly could be done at the federal level um, to really figure out a way for, frankly, Congress to do its job, right, and to enter into these complicated political spaces and to really figure out a way for um, forward for the majority of Americans, people of goodwill, to figure out how do we live together. And so the CCCU began exploring, could this be possible at the federal level? And I think Tyler will mention a little more um, about kind of the process is and where we've gone from there. But eventually we came to be put in connection with the American Community Fund through some um, colleagues on the Hill who had talked to both of us separately and said, you're both in here asking us the same questions. Why don't you talk to each other and come back if there's a way to make this possible? And so working with so many other partners in Washington, D.C., we've been working and exploring together, is it possible to come up with a piece of federal legislation that could meet the needs of the LGBT community and the religious community? And We've been working closely with um, lots of different religious partners, including colleagues um, that represent the LDS Church and, and working on this endeavor. And it's been such um, an, an encouraging process because I think um, as somebody who works in the religious liberty space and um, falls in, apparently now there's a new, we're, we're neither millennials nor Gen Xers. They're, they've carved out this five year window that I fall in. Um, so I'm not really sure what I am, but, but uh, I think we're called like the nuns or something for generations. Um, but as somebody who works in that space and sees how deeply important religious liberty is to our society, and how deeply important institutions are, in particular are for, for our society, but then also sees the way that religious freedom is perceived by younger generations. I've been deeply concerned that we are heading on a trajectory that is very negative for religious freedom and for institutions, which we heard of a panel just last on this stage speak about how important institutions are for the fabric of society, for sustaining that, for civic values, virtues, and of course, religious freedoms. We, you know, think about them often, and they often receive a lot of, I think, public sympathy more when they're in personal, private contexts. Right? I think of the the prisoner um, who want, and the Muslim prisoner in Arkansas who wanted to grow a beard and wanted the Supreme Court case, but. I saw very different reactions among people to his plight than to the plight of a religious university who's wanting to um, exercise their religious freedoms. And so I think the fact that we are in a more individualistic moment right now in our culture, rather than, and, and you know, institutions, the reputation of institutions, the value of institutions is, is low, right now and so the religious freedom particularly for institutions is a very hard case to make and so i've been encouraged that coming together in washington dc actually trying to solve a political problem um, that it's it, and for people of goodwill to work together to actually try to meet the needs of each other's uh, constituencies problems etc is actually possible so we've been in that and we can talk more about that later but i thought I would make a couple of comments um, about why I think in particular that fairness for all is not just important because of the merits of what it is in this particular, again, political problem that we see ourselves facing, which is, of course, vitally important. Um, the religious colleges, universities, um, BYU, where we are here, um, Catholic University in Washington, D.C., our members are 
incredibly important both to society and to the religious communities themselves as places where religious thought and religious scholarship is, is promoted and where a different idea of pursuing truth is added into culture, added into society. I like to refer to it as capital T truth, not just lower T truth, which of course is the academy generally. And so I think there's this beautiful synergy actually between faith-based academic institutions and the academy, and they fall into both pursuing the truth, which we in the religious space believe there is a capital T truth that uh, informs and serves as the source of small t truth. But regardless of whether you have that kind of view of capital T truth or not, the pursuit of small, truth, of, of small t truth is what the academy is about. And so I think there's this beautiful synergy between the two that we in the religious higher education space in particular can do an ever increasingly better job of telling that story and making that case. And I think that so for fairness for all is important this political problem that we're facing right now is of course endemic of the larger social problem about the true nature of tolerance, the true nature of diversity. So the virtues, the values, tolerance, diversity, very few people would say that they're against those. Um, and, and they're good things to be for. But then when you actually scratch and dig a little deeper under the surface of, well, what does that mean? I think it's important for people to understand that, and, and this I think is what the beauty of institutions, in educational institutions, civic institutions, um, institutions that do uh, public good, uh, or, you know, uh, serve the serve public needs. Um, what they do is they actually institutions need diversity as well, right? If diversity means that every institution has to have the exact same blend of composite of people, religious, political, secular, racial, etc., ultimately what we would have is no diversity at all. And so I think that one case that we are trying to make in Washington, D.C., and that I think Fairness for All is an ex it helps us make the case, helps us tell the story of how actually diversity is not just something that means every institution has to have the same kind of breakdown and composite of people and perspectives, but that actually institutions themselves can have can have a significant amount of diversity within what from the outside may appear to be a more homogeneous community, but actually there are a wide variety of perspectives. You can take you know, a, a, a institution even with one particular denomination of religious tradition, and then with, if you're someone from within that religious tradition or perspective, you know there's a great deal of diversity, right, within even what it means to hold that particular religious view or even perspective on that religious view. And the same thing with tolerance, right? Is tolerance merely not perpetuating harm on someone else? Or is it actually the ability to appreciate difference? And I think that's the other component that I think something like a fairness for all, this structure, this idea that we're going to preserve space and society, that we're going to protect uh, the ability for individuals, for institutions, to have different beliefs and different ideas about the way in which they intend to go about moving through their lives and, and operating in the world and forming their communities and their families. And they can be very different views and they can actually not just be tolerated in the sense that harm is not perpetuated on them, or, but they are actually appreciated. When I think of this, I, I would encourage each of you to um, go to like YouTube and and just search um, search the clip. There was this Amazon commercial. I don't know if any of you saw it. It was a year or so. But I think it was last Christmas, and it was this commercial of um, this. Uh, you see this imam knocking at the door, and the door opens, and it's a priest, and he um, walks in, and they sit down, and you see them drinking a cup of tea together, and then they're <coughs> sitting there on the couch chatting, and it's all silent. You're just observing this thing, this music playing in the back, and you see them both kind of rubbing their knees. They both been on their knees praying, and their knees are sore. And so eventually they get up, and they say goodbye, and they hug, and the, the imam leaves the priest's home, and two days later, it's an Amazon Prime commercial, so within 48 hours, 
uh, they both have a package on their front step, and they open the package, and it is a pair of knee pads. And they have sent one another a pair of knee pads because their knees are both sore from their regular time in prayer. And I think this commercial for me is so, it is so picturesque of what I think that we should be aspiring for. And we um, hope that Fairness for All, uh, if this is ever able to you know, go through and become the law of the land, could create this space for difference. And for not just difference that says, you're different and I have to put up with you. Well, you're different, and I can actually appreciate that about you. And as someone on the previous panel said, and walk our dogs together, and be friends, and work together for streetlights, and, and in the things where we do share space, and do share commonality, and appreciate what's different about one another. Deeply disagree, but appreciate one another in spite of that disagreement, not um, trying to cordon ourselves off, or harm someone else, or ostracize someone else, or put someone else into uh, out of business, frankly, in the Christian college space, right? By cutting off accreditation or Title IV funding uh, for religious colleges and universities. And it's been such a delight uh, for the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities to have the opportunity to work so deeply here with people at the BYU who are committed to these same principles, to work um, with colleagues at Yeshiva University, with Zaytuna University, for faith-based colleges and universities to come together and to really promote um, something that I different, that a different idea than the way we so often think in our culture, which is that we can have deep differences. Our institutions, each of those institutions that I reference can have deeply different religious perspectives and yet can be so grateful that the other institution is there so grateful that they're um, contributing to society in the unique and special way that they are doing that. And to really, I hope, paint a picture of actually, on the last panel they talked about how religious liberty has become uh, code for discrimination, right? And that phrase is too often used and too often believed. And it actually can show that religious liberty is not about um, what somebody else can't do or should do. It's about preserving space for people of religion and people who hold no religious beliefs to be able to hold those beliefs and to continue to engage in society um, fully and to really, I like to say, really duke it out in the marketplace of ideas rather than trying to use the law to prohibit or prevent the full engagement of society through um, through certain laws that, that ostracize or exclude certain communities. So thank you, Brett. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Shapri. Next, we'll hear from uh, Tyler Deaton, the president of Allegiance Strategies. Thank you. Um, and one, I'm here today because one of the, the big projects that I run is called American Unity Fund, and it's sister organization, American Unity PAC. Um, these are both conservative groups that work within the conservative movement to advance LGBT freedom. American Unity PAC is a super PAC that works to elect or re-elect pro-LGBT Republicans. Um, there's really nothing else like it that's doing that kind of work just within the broader conservative project as conservatives, funded by conservatives, funding other like-minded conservatives to develop a new vision of what small government advocacy could look like that's inclusive of gay and transgender people. Um, I'm really happy to be back in Utah. It's a state that I've done a lot of work in. Um, I'm grateful to BYU Law for putting on a conference like this that brings together so many different people with very clearly some, some different perspectives on these issues. Uh, but I just think it's so cool that I can be here at BYU Law and have this rainbow sticker on my badge. Um, and I think that that speaks to the authentic commitment that that BYU and, and the LDS Church has had to make the world a safer and a fairer and a better place for the LGBT community, even while there are still inevitably going to be political disagreements, theological disagreements, I just think that it's important to recognize, and, and Shapri alluded to this, that this is a state um, and this is a community that has pioneered what the future could look like, of what a balanced approach could look like, where religious freedom is respected and protected by the law. 
and where LGBT people and their human dignity is respected and protected by the law. Um, I'm on the panel today. I think I'm, I'm the one non-lawyer on the panel today. Um, I really am I'm probably going to talk a little bit more as a result about the culture. And there is a, a strong interplay between the way that the law changes and the way that the culture changes. And I do think that they can go hand in hand. But I think that what we're all witnessing already is a huge culture change in our country when it comes to LGBT freedom. Um, and a troubling culture change when it comes to how people view religion as a whole in our country. I grew up in Alabama in a very conservative family. I was raised in the Assembly of God Church, if you're familiar with it. Um, all right, I like it. Um, the, uh, the kind of the formative experience for me was going off to college. I went to Wheaton College in Illinois, um, which again, a lot of you are probably familiar with, and it is where I met my now husband our freshman year um, funnily enough, on a college Republican 72-hour get-out-the-vote bus trip to Wisconsin to knock on doors for George W. Bush, and at that time, a candidate for state senate in Kenosha, who you will now know as Reince Priebus, but at that point ran a failed campaign for state senate. We are dropping literature, and that's where I first met my husband. Um, and then we sang in concert choir together at Wheaton College, and the rest is history. Um, so I have, I have some of these sorts of conflicts that are out there embodied in my own personal life. As you can imagine, whenever I first came out to my parents, um, the first few years weren't easy. Um, but then over time they came to see that I was still their son and Jay, my husband, was going to be their son. And that we still had the same kind of conservative values, the same commitment to family and to marriage as an important institution and that there was less different maybe than they thought there would be. And I actually think that that's what's happened around the whole country, is that as same-sex couples have married, um, people have seen that maybe things aren't exactly the same, uh, but that gay and, and straight people are, are wanting to marry for similar reasons, um, and wanting to form families, and wanting to love each other and take care of each other, which I think is a very good thing. I think it's also a very good thing then to make sure that those who disagree with that in their religion, in their institutions, that reflect the organization and the exercise of their religion that those should be protected and that they don't have to participate in things that they disagree with and that the government and especially the federal government shouldn't be able to come after those sorts of groups and punish them um, with things like threatening their tax status or taking away their opportunity to compete for federal grants and contracts. I think that there are there are real problems though that are out there in the society that a lot of times we end up talking a lot about bakers and we end up talking a lot about institutions or we talk a lot about maybe radical activists doing something that's profane or vulgar. And I think that, you know, and you see how that ends up being on both sides. Everybody kind of sees the straw men that they want to see. And for me, my motivation in this, especially whenever I, I first started, you know, out of college working in politics, I, I came into this work wanting to fight for the freedom to marry. And for example, I didn't really know transgender people. And I, I wasn't even at that point really familiar with this idea of the need for LGBT people to be included in our nation's civil rights laws or employment discrimination or housing discrimination and business service discrimination and the way that it affects gay and transgender people. But it, it was eye-opening for me as I was starting to do some of my earlier work on fighting for the freedom to marry to meet transgender people and to see the struggles that they've gone through and to meet other gay people and to see the struggles that they've gone through and to make sure that all of you know the very real crisis that is out there still in our country, that it does persist, that 50% more likely LGBT people are going to be unemployed. LGBT people are 33% more likely to be living in poverty. Transgender people are nine times more likely to try to, to, try to kill themselves. Senator Hatch, senior senator from Utah, spoke last week actually on the Senate floor about that exact issue um, and I really appreciated to see how he talked about the issue of LGBT youth suicide in the context of his religious faith and what his values teach him about why we as a community, as Utah, as Americans, as Christians, as whatever, that we all have a crisis here happening right under our, our noses. Um, and, I, and I could go on with those sorts of statistics that are out there that are real that you know, runaway youth, 
Up to 40% of the runaway youth are LGBT. And these are heartbreaking statistics that I will also tell you, I don't think that passing a law is what's going to fix all of that. I think that passing a law is what gives people recourse such that when there is a bad apple out there, when a landlord discovers that their tenant is transitioning and evicts them, which is a very frequent story, that what the, the kind of discrimination that transgender people face is often when they are transitioning. And I guess that, that can kind of make sense that, that maybe somebody's rented them a house or an apartment or they've hired them and now all of a sudden they're transitioning and, and somebody says, well, I, I, I don't know you as this person. Um, but then they react without, without showing love. They show them a mean-spirited attitude. And of course it makes sense then that it's also whenever transgender people are probably the most vulnerable is when they're transitioning. And so for them to face the kind of disproportionate discrimination that's out there, there ought to be a law that they could go to to win back their home or to win back their job or at least to be compensated for the damage that they face whenever they are just trying to live their lives peacefully, pursue their American dream, make money for their family, protect their kids. And those are the sorts of issues that have me deeply concerned and why I'm involved in this sort of work is that I see that those stories are out there and I see that small businesses with religious convictions ought to be protected absolutely. I believe that religious institutions ought to be protected absolutely in their employment, um, kind of in, in their financial relationship with the federal government or with state governments, they ought to be protected, but that there has to be, and it's an urgent need, there has to be a way to find a solution as soon as possible to protect the LGBT community from the discrimination that is legal in over 30 states. Because there is no federal law that protects sexual orientation or gender identity. Utah, um, by embarking on a huge undertaking, working with an in-state group that, I don't, I, there might actually be some people in here who are familiar with Equality Utah. It's the in-state um, sort of umbrella LGBT advocacy group, which, from my perspective, having funded Equality Utah and supported Equality Utah and tried to give them national support for what they were trying to do on behalf of the LGBT community in this state, um, they wanted to meet with religious leaders and they wanted to find common ground. And it has not just been through trying to pass a law, it has been that, and they successfully passed an employment and housing, non-discrimination law, but I do think that it has changed the culture in Utah for the better. I think that more than just having a law, because by the way, a lot of Americans already think this kind of discrimination is illegal, which is one of our challenges, is that over 70% of Americans already think it's illegal. Um, and it's hard to sort of create that urgency that people know how bad the problems are and how important it is to have a law. Um, but in Utah, there have been some remarkable changes here at the state and local level. Equality Utah has continued to partner with religious organizations, including the LDS Church here in Utah, to promote welfare for LGBT youth, to have a very successful program for homeless LGBT youth, to have anti-suicide programs that they're able to work on constructively. And I don't see that in other states. I was asked earlier today why the, the Fairness for All model, which was adopted in Utah, hasn't gone to other states. And, and this will be my second to last point, which is why isn't this already the case? Why have other states not followed Utah? Because they haven't. It's important to recognize that since the law was passed here in Utah, um, other states have not followed Utah's lead. And there is a huge cacophony of voices on the extremes of both sides of our two major political parties and just across our political spectrum that is not invested in a solution or invested in compromise. And from my personal view of watching how similar bills have been introduced in other states, they keep falling to the voices of extremists on, on both sides. And, and one of the struggles has been that there really hasn't been maybe a, a center-right voice that's been quite as powerful in one of these other states to step up and really hold the line on the center-right. But I would also tell you perhaps there hasn't been as strong of an incentive because since the Utah law passed, many on the left across the country have been a little jumpy. Like, what, what, what just happened? We weren't, we weren't part of this. We weren't consulted, how dare they? And that attitude 
um, is palpable. And it's something that we have to contend with, which is that there are people who think that protecting religious freedom in the context of an LGBT civil rights bill is wrong. That there shouldn't be exemptions, religious employers shouldn't be exempted, houses of worship should be subject to certain public accommodations laws, things like that. And then of course on the right, there's all sorts of other complaints and objections that you've all heard and are familiar with. And so getting into the middle space and building political power there is really the mission that we have, that if you're going to see what Shapri is describing, kind of a balanced approach, then the middle from both sides, the center left and the center right, are going to have to work together and make it a priority and be willing to go against the, the sort of extreme voices in both camps and say, no, this is the right thing, this is the important thing, this is the urgent thing to do. Um, the last thing that I wanted to share is after the Utah law passed, um, we, we wanted to kind of track the implementation and to see how it goes. And I think that the implementation has really been another success story of just like, not only was the law passed, but it's helped change the culture. There was a public school teacher that was interviewed by the Wall Street Journal about her experience living here in Utah. She was transgender. Um, before the law passed, she was actually not out as transgender. Um, so what the Wall Street Journal interviewed her. We then sent out a team to interview her and some other people. I don't have enough time to show you all of these stories, but I want you to know how life-changing it is. And so we're going to just share one video example of somebody who lives here in Utah who was positively impacted by the, by the Utah Compromise. Me personally, Utah Bill saved my life. There's no question in my soul that I was dying inside. And I retired from the Air Force as a pilot in, in the year 2004. Uh, and since then, Sandy and I both have been working in one form or another with special needs children. Before the summer, she used to come to work as a man. I believe with everything that I am, that if I had come out uh, as being who I am, I believe that I would have been fired. The fall of 2015, I started school as myself. This bill in Utah, gave me, gave me my dignity. And I, there's, there's dozens of stories like this that we know of personally, and I'm sure there's all sorts of other stories that we don't know of personally. And I think that it shows you that here's a, a woman who works in a public school, taxpayer funded public school, who is working with special needs students who's afraid that she's going to be fired if she's honest about her authentic self. And I think that that shows it very plainly because what you would see in a fairness model and what you see in Utah is that these sorts of employment rules don't apply to a religious school. But they do apply to public schools. Um, which is of course, you know, and from my perspective, and, and what you would agree is where most of the employment is at in our country. And so the idea that we could provide recourse and protection for people who are in you know, Fortune 500 companies working for the government, working for state and local government, and then still find a way to create islands of protection for religious institutions that are durable and that are permanent. It'd be a wonderful thing. So there's still a lot of work to do, and I've glossed over some of what the objections are from the left and the right to moving forward with such an approach. Um, and maybe we'll get into some of that. But I did want you to at least understand the importance of why this sort of effort of finding common ground between religious liberty and LGBT freedom is so important. All right, uh, thank you very much, Tyler. Let me uh, turn the uh, floor to uh, Professor Eskridge. Uh, well, like uh, my co-panelists, I'm very grateful to Brett for being such a great graduate of the Yale Law School <laughs> and uh, to uh, BYU for inviting me here. I'm very regretful that my partner is not able to join us. Uh, Lynn Wardle is in Hong Kong uh, with his uh, legal wife. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of like his work spouse. <laughs> now, uh, I want to just say uh, a few things. And I want to start with uh, that brilliant keynote that we heard this morning. I hope everybody was here to uh, enjoy it. And I've asked the conference organizers that they can put it up on their website. It's so brilliant. And uh, a central point that Elder Clayton made to us all, uh, and I think he was specifically talking to uh, Ivy League law professors that teach in a very secular environment, 
Uh, and they don't really spend much time on uh, teaching about respect for religion and religious liberty. Uh, and his, his take on point, uh, using uh, the elder's metaphor, uh, is that religion, he analogized to race and sex, which are established categories you should not discriminate based upon, uh, is part of a person's marrow. Uh, now, race and sex might be considered part of uh, one's genetic, biological, physical marrow. Uh, and he's making a brilliant metaphor that uh, part of our marrow is not just the stuff that's related to genes uh, and to literal biology, uh, but also our psychological and spiritual makeup. Uh, and that, therefore, uh, religion is not uh, anything like a consumer choice. Uh, it's a very deep part of people's personalities. It varies from person to person, and it's all consuming. And I think that's absolutely right for exactly the reasons that uh, Elder Clayton gave us. Uh, I'd like to extend his metaphor, however, uh, and with due respect to, to the church that is hosting us, uh, I would like to historicize this in a way that might be offensive, so I apologize. Uh, for many decades, particularly in the 1960s and 70s, uh, the view of at least many of the LDS leaders, I don't know that this was the official view of the church, I don't think it was a revelation, uh, but the view of many of the leaders, uh, and indeed the practice here at BYU, uh, was that sexual orientation uh, is a, a choice. It's a perverse choice, is the belief. Uh, it is a choice that can be reversed. And indeed, uh, many students here at BYU were subjected to aversion therapy uh, and other mechanisms, some of them very close to torture, uh, others of them just psychological talking, uh, that were an effort to change uh, one's orientation from something that was considered unacceptable to the Lord something that was considered uh, more acceptable. Uh, that was a disaster. Uh, the views of uh, leaders of the church have changed remarkably uh, in a very short period of time, particularly in the new millennium. So that on the Gays and Mormons website, which I think might be an official LDS website, uh, uh, this idea is rejected. Uh, the sexual orientation uh, is uh, a choice. Uh, I do invite, however, uh, the Mormon communities to explore that somewhat more deeply. I engaged uh, Elder Clayton afterwards, and I said, well, I think there is this similarity and this parallel. Uh, and he was very generous, and uh, he said, well, yes, I think it's all just a mystery, the sexual orientation stuff. Uh, and I would invite, I invited him, uh, and I invite all of you, to read Tom Christofferson's remarkable book, uh, That We May Be One. Uh, there are other books that you could also read, but this is one that is very close to the church. Uh, and it's one that Elder Clayton had read and highly recommends as well. I hope I'm not putting words to his mouth. And you cannot read that book without coming away with exactly the same impression about sexual orientation uh, that Elder Clayton made about religion. Uh, it is part of a person's <coughs> It is uh, a completely saturating feature of people's personalities. And not just gay, straight. Uh, if you're of a straight orientation, uh, just think about it, which many of you probably are. Uh, this saturates your personality. You cannot imagine what it would be like if this were not part of you. Well, I, I will tell you, the same thing is true if you are gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender, which is not a sexual orientation but a gender identity. Uh, and I would urge everyone to read that book. Because the way that we moved forward in 2015 Utah, and I've spoken, uh, Cliff Roski was a student of mine. I've spoken to many of the legislators. Stuart Adams, I consider now a friend. Robin Wilson, our very good friends. We're like, uh, I've broken up with Lynn, and I think Robin is my new uh, sort of work spouse. And talking to all those people, we were only able to move forward uh, I hope I'm not revealing confidences through the following mise en scène. Uh, and that was through mutual outreach from the quality Utah folks to the church and vice versa. Uh, there was a meeting on neutral ground, uh, a very lovely house here in, or a lovely house in Salt Lake City, I believe, uh, where uh, representatives of Equality Utah, representatives of the church met 
And here's the way they proceeded. They just sat down and they said, well, why don't each of us say something about him or herself? Tell us your journey story. And they did. And they found out that they actually had a lot in common. Uh, that did not resolve all the many differences. It took years of discussions. Uh, and, but I think the discussions begin with the idea that we actually do have a lot in common and genuinely to try to understand from the other person's point of view where she or he is coming from. Okay, now, in, in that spirit, I'm a constitutional law professor, among other things. Uh, let me legalize and constitutionalize some of this discussion in a way that I hope if you're not lawyers, you can appreciate and get something out of as well. I'll let you know. And, uh, and here's the way I look at it. Uh, I think, and I wrote a whole Yale Law Journal article on this uh, about 20 years ago, way in advance of all this stuff. And uh, I, it was an article that was harshly critical of the Supreme Court's uh, viciously anti-LDS decisions in the late 19th century. Justice Scalia had revived them and had celebrated them, actually celebrated them, in his famous dissent in Romer versus Evans, where he also criticizes the Supreme Court's move, move in protecting gay rights. Uh, and I had not read some of them. Uh, I read some of them, and others not. And I read them, and they were just, every one of them is appalling. Appalling. Uh, uh, I think Bowers and Hardwick is appalling, for a lot of the same reasons. Uh, and it does seem to me that in terms of the structure of the Constitution, there is a structural similarity of the protections that LGBT rights lawyers, like Chris Roski and others, have been relying on for the last 20 years, and provisions of the Constitution, differently situated, uh, that religious liberty advocates have been relying on in the last 20 years. Uh, and I could go into greater and boring detail, but let me give you the, the large parameters of it. Uh, you can think of the Constitution as giving us a continuum. Uh, and at one end of the continuum are what you could call liberty protections, you could also call them free exercise protections. <coughs> I see a parallelism, for example, between Lawrence versus Texas, which is the Kennedy opinion which protected uh, lesbian and gay adults engaged in consensual activities within the home. Sweeps more broadly, but that was the core of it. Uh, and Justice Kennedy said this is an area of human life where people ought to be able to make their own choices as to how they construct their lives. The government cannot commandeer your life. He said that to LGBT people, and perhaps others. Uh, the Supreme Court, before Justice Kennedy, had also said that to the Amish, in the famous Yoder, Wisconsin case. Uh, the Amish, for religious reasons, uh, wanted to homeschool their children at a certain age. The Supreme Court said, this is a decision in constructing your lives and your families that the government cannot lightly interfere with. We saw it very recently in a Supreme Court decision, I think by the Chief Justice in Hosanna Tabor, where the Supreme Court held that an anti-discrimination law could not be constitutionally applied to a minister of a religious faith. And the argument there was not that anti-discrimination laws are unimportant, but instead that there is a dimension of human life Instruction that the government strongly, presumptively, cannot interfere in. And of course, that's religion. That went under the banner of both the free exercise and the establishment clause. Uh, and I, as a constitutional law professor, will tell you I am not sure the nomenclature makes a big difference. Whether it's due process liberty or First Amendment free exercise or establishment, there is that core area. And it does seem to me there ought to be uh, common ground. Uh, among sexual and gender minorities, religious minorities, and by the way, that is a hugely overlapping group. So many LGBT people are devoutly religious. I'm Presbyterian, and whatever that tells you about me uh, in terms of where I am on the devoutness calendar. <laughs> um, same goes for, uh, and now look at the other end. The other end of the continuum are not the intensely private areas, but the intensely public areas. In other words, the government. And then the admonition is, well, the government, of course, is very public, is very open, 
There's lots and lots of things going on. And the basic rule is a rule of neutrality. That there are certain things the government cannot do in terms of excluding or discriminating without very good justification. Now again, LGBT people have been making this argument. Uh, we made this argument, for example, in the Romer case, the Colorado case from 1996, uh, where LGBT people were basically excluded from protect ordinary protections of law, at least the way the uh, initiative was drafted by the people who drafted it. The Supreme Court struck that down. Uh, we also see the Windsor case as something similar. Uh, that was the Defense of Marriage Act, President Clinton's great masterpiece, uh, where the Supreme Court said uh, this on its face and in its legislative history and its effect only carves out a certain kind of family and they don't do it with sufficient justification to pass constitutional muster. Now you see the same exact kind of reasoning in religion cases. I'm going to take a rather oldie but goldie at Dr. Kennedy opinion. The University of Virginia in its student newspaper said, we will not allow religion-based appeals, religion-based articles. The Supreme Court struck it down. Now, that violates the religion clauses. Very similar in some ways. The government was not being neutral. It was excluding a whole discourse. We saw it very recently in the Missouri Lutheran case, a very a government program involving gravel uh, excluding a religious institution, the Supreme Court struck that down as well. Here's the point. And then we see through all of these cases, um, from Romer, the gay rights case, to Masterpiece Hate, that's the case just a few weeks ago, where in all of these cases, uh, the Supreme Court has said, even when what the government is doing might look neutral, if there is strong evidence that they're doing it based upon animus, whether it's anti-gay animus or anti-religious animus. Anti-religious animus was the masterpiece cake case. So, so it's it's a very important holding, actually. Uh, many scholars are dismissing it. Oh, it's just they've done the issue. It's a one-off, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's actually a very foundational case, and in my opinion, it links very directly to Romer v. Evans, not coincidentally, opinion by Justice Kennedy. Okay, here's a third set of points I want to make. And that is, let's think about the Utah statute. Let's think about Utah. That's where we're located. We do live here. Robbie George, who is a friend of the LDS Church and a frequent visitor here in Utah, uh, wrote a wonderful book called uh, Making Men Moral, where he lays out a theory of perfectionist pluralism, or pluralist perfectionism, whichever you choose. And his core idea is that the liberal understanding of the state is not quite right. That the government actually should be uh, giving us advice, should be setting forth uh, things that are admirable, like marriage might be one good example. You cannot understand American law without understanding the normativity of marriage. Now, it might be diminishing, but that is traditionally been core to American law. Uh, many of you, I hope, would agree with me that, that this has been a good thing. But, Robbie argues, within a perfectionist vision, uh, it is foolish and perhaps immoral for the government to commandeer and impose that vision uh, on everybody. <coughs> it can recommend, it can lobby, it can reward, it can encourage. Uh, but their, uh, its ability to commandeer uh, should be somewhat limited. Uh, and I think that idea is at the center of the 2015 Utah statute. Uh, I prefer it not to call it, as many of you all have today, the Utah Compromise. Uh, I think it was an example of what Henry Richardson calls a deeply principled statute. It's a complicated statute, but that does not make it a compromise. The ability of two groups to come together to produce something does not inevitably require uh, either group to compromise its principles or its beliefs. I think it does require groups to listen to one another and to accommodate one another. I think that's somewhat different. 
Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that more in a second. But I also want to flag a statute that is just as important and that is very consistent with the vision that I've laid out at the earlier part of what I said. And that is a recent law. Equality Utah sued the state of Utah for having an extensive set of statutes, which I call the no promo homo educational law in Utah. It required Utah schools uh, to uh, not only not promote homosexuality, but in some cases to uh, teach some false things about it. Uh, Equality Utah sued Utah before they could win their lawsuit, and they would have won their lawsuit, I believe. Uh, Senator Adams, who was uh, the main sponsor of the 2015 statute, uh, spearheaded another statute which repealed the no promo homo statutes, uh, which I think was a very positive move, not just from the point of view of LGBT youth, Tyler, but also from the point of view of Utah generally. Uh, now to pursue my idea that the 2015 statute uh, is not appropriate to call it a compromise, because I, I don't think uh, uh, the uh, national groups, I'm a part of what you can call the gayocracy <laughs> in um, Washington, D.C. and whatnot. So I'm part of all of this. Uh, so I'm part of the enemy for some of you, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the uh, national groups were intimately involved at every point in the conversation. Cliff Roski was my student. Uh, uh, I taught him better. Uh, he talks to people. Uh, they did not like some of the things that he was selling. Them. They tried to veto a lot of it. But he and Equality Utah and you all here in Utah made the decisions. And they were, uh, say, purport to be delighted with the outcome. But here's the danger. Uh, their favorite phrase is, this was great, but not to be replicated. Okay. Just for Utah. And here's the response that has got to be developed to that kind of discourse. And that is, why were accommodations made? You want to come up with an explanation which is consistent with my constitutional stuff. And it's not just, well, we did it just to satisfy them so they'll pass the statute. Let me give you a couple of examples of some of the controversial ones. And then one that I think was absolutely brilliant. Uh, so there's an exemption for BYU. Uh, so BYU could have its rules on student housing, for example. Now here's a way of thinking about this. And again, you all know BYU better than I do. But uh, the core protections of the religion clauses, and I think of the liberty clause as well, um, is not only go to churches, but also go to cemeteries. Now, they don't extend to uh, secular universities or schools. Uh, and they also probably don't extend in toto to every school that has some religious uh, association. I went to Davidson, which is a Presbyterian school. A majority of the Board of Trustees are Presbyterians. I do not consider Davidson a religious school in the way that BYU is. That is a fact. Now, at the risk of abusing a metaphor, so please don't be insulted by this, I do think there's a continuum in terms of schools, from purely secular schools, which Davidson is close to being, to pure seminaries. Seminaries are clearly protected by the free exercise clause against governmental interference. Purely secular schools like Davidson, I think, are not. I think BYU is much closer to the seminary part of it because I think the mission of BYU is a much more uh, explicitly and invested religious training mission than Davidson. And I went to Davidson, and I'm an expert on that, but I didn't go to BYU. And that's my pitch on BYU. I fully support what they did in 2015. Uh, I also support, there's also um, uh, the Boy Scouts are not covered. Well, I think that might be an even easier one. Uh, the US Supreme Court held in the Dale case in 2000, Justice Kennedy, part of the majority, uh, that the Boy Scouts were protected uh, by their freedom of association against the application of the New Jersey anti-discrimination law against them. Uh, and there are many details of the case that make that a very exceptional one. Uh, but I do personally think that it's a bad idea and bad policy from an LGBT point of view to impose us upon private associational groups 
that want to maintain their own mental autonomy. Uh, and so I think that's defensible as well. Though so that was a five to four decision. So here's something. So I, here's something that I absolutely adore about the 2015 Utah statute. It's very innovative. Uh, and that is there's a special provision in there that goes out of its way, again neutrally, to protect speech by employees within corporations for LGBT, for religious minorities, for, for everybody. As long as the corporation, you know, unless the corporation has a neutral blanket rule that's related to business necessity, they've got to allow employees to talk about themselves. This goes back to Elder Clayton's idea about the narrow. Okay, now I have three bad things to tell you. Three uh, dangers. I'm sorry, your time is up. These are short bad things. We want to hear them. These are short bad things. That's right, you can't do that. You can do that. The students at Yale are, are really vicious to the faculty. Uh, unlike you, I think the students are very respectful to the faculty. So here are three, three dangers. Uh, like the uh, Lost in Space uh, TV show, where the robot says, Danger, Will Robinson. Uh, for LGBT rights, a real danger on the horizon is the Neil Gorsuch argument uh, in the Masterpiece Cake case. Uh, or at least the implications of it. We don't exactly know what he means by it. But he uh, joined the Kennedy opinion, but he went further and he said that doing business in cakes and many other things is an expressive activity which is directly protected by the First Amendment. Uh, well, as Brett will be an example, the Yale Law School turns out very clever attorneys. Uh, I think BYU probably turns out cleverer attorneys. Uh, and there are very few BYU and Yale Law School attorneys who could not turn almost any business enterprise into an expressive activity, okay. including teaching law students. That's a danger. Here's another danger, if I can again tread on the border of the insulting. We heard this afternoon about the danger in which people were finding spirituality in politics. I think the obverse danger is much greater. And again, I'm not sure that this is the LDS church, but this is American religion. Uh, and that is the consumerization and the, politicis and the politicization and the hollowing out of spirituality within American religion. Uh, and that is where, and I've been to religious services in all sorts of denominations, from Jerry Falwell's, Jerry Falwell's uh, uh, church in Lynchburg, Virginia, is much closer to the Red Skelton Variety Hour than it is to a traditional religious service. Uh, I was shocked uh, by, by how, how much it was. Um, and so I think one danger uh, is that people are getting now in church increasingly politics and entertainment in church. And churches of uh, the secularization of religion does risk, when we heard this afternoon about what religion has to contribute to the public good, uh, I think religion's contribution is optimized when it is actually a spiritual, non-secular contribution than it wins in the other. Uh, and then a final one, which I think you'll find most disturbing, and I'll, again, I'll tie it to the LDS Church, uh, is that uh, uh, Justice Alito was right. This should not be gainsaid. He was the dissenter in Obergefell. And he said, uh, whatever Justice Kennedy says in Obergefell and then later in the Masterpiece Cake case, uh, the approval of uh, marriage equality for LGBT people will have an effect on religion based upon not government coercion necessarily, but based upon social norms. Uh, and I will tell you, you can look at the polls yourself, uh, among young people, people in their 20s, whatever their religious background, uh, support for uh, same-sex marriage is very high, much higher on the whole than it is uh, for their parents' generation, or their grandparents' generation. Uh, and if social norms do continue to change in that way, uh, and teenagers are even more monolithic, uh, that will put pressure on religion. And I'm not talking about government pressure. 
and I'm opposed to boycotts, and I'm opposed to all this, and I'm opposed to all that. I don't matter. I do not matter. Uh, and the LDS Church has seen this before. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, there was a racial discrimination in some of the LDS policies for many years. Uh, and it was uh, finally revoked in 1978, the last vestige of it, 1978. Uh, Spencer Kimball's son, Ed Kimball, has written about how his father and his colleagues came to this. And certainly there was a, 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 a prayerful consideration, a lot of deliberation. Uh, but Ed says a major reason why the policy was revoked, and this is a doctrinal policy, this is a revelation from the Lord, uh, was changing social norms. Uh, that r racial uh, discriminations, even minor ones, were not considered acceptable in 1978 in ways that they would have been considered more okay even for a private institution in 1958. Um, and other religions, this is not an LDS thing, other religions. I'm a Presbyterian. Um, the founder of the Southern Presbyterian Church that I grew up in, Richard Palmer, was the great, great in a horrible sense, theorist of apartheid, the biblical case for apartheid. Um, and the Presbyterians adhered to that through the end of the 19th, end of the 20th centuries. So, uh, and, and we abandoned that, as I think we should have. But we didn't abandon it, I think, because God spoke to us, et cetera, et cetera. But the Presbyterians, I think, mainly abandoned it because of social norms. And then we felt that our reading of the Bible was no longer correct. So having said all that, probably exceeding my time, I hope that. You know, it's uh, very uh, uh, interesting and enlightening. Thank you. Uh, just to set your mind at ease, you don't have to worry about anyone worrying that uh, LDS sacrament meeting services are becoming too entertaining. <laughs> 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 Unlike conferences, which I think are just full of fun. <laughs> so uh, the Red Skeleton Hour is, uh, its monopoly on entertainment is safe. I don't even know who Red Skeleton is. <laughs> uh, think John Stewart. Okay. <laughs> Except they're not as amusing as he is. All right, uh, so let me turn the uh, microphone to uh, Tom Berg, uh, James L. Oberstar, Professor of Law and Public Policy. University of uh, St. Tom Thomas School of Law. And let me just mention that St. Thomas is a relatively new law school that takes seriously its uh, identity as a Catholic law school. So uh, a, 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 a school that does have uh, certain strands of um, character and concern that uh, resonate with us here at BYU. Yeah, that's correct. Um, good, so I'm in the um, position uh, as the last person usually is, of having the burdens and benefits of having all of my brilliant ideas already said. <laughs> so, uh, but I'll say them uh, anyways. Uh, I approach the conflicts between same-sex marriage and religious liberty from the perspective of advocating for both rights in articles uh, and in briefs in the Supreme Court in both Obergefell on behalf on the side of the same-sex couples and in Masterpiece on the side of the baker. Uh, I think Doug Laycock and I and the Cato Institute are the only lawyers that filed briefs on those sides in, in the two cases. Uh, the classic American response to a deep conflict like that between gay rights and, religious, and traditional religious faith is to protect the liberty of both sides. The very arguments that underlie protection of same-sex marriage also support strong protection for religious liberty. And other people have touched on this, including the very moving speech this morning. I'll try to put it in my own framework. I think there's a long list of parallels between the two. And uh, Bill uh, wrote, wrote this. I, I wrote a few years later in some of the same, same vein. Religious traditionalists and same-sex couples each argue that a fundamental component of their identity and the conduct that flows from that identity should be left to each individual, free of all non-essential government regulation. Have your sexual orientation, just don't act on it. Have your religious belief, but don't act on it. 
Both of those claims ring hollow for much the same reason. Uh, as we put Bill Eskridge and Tyler Deaton uh, uh, together uh, with Elder Clayton, and we get uh, the, the proposition that these are not simple matters of choice in either case. Both groups also claim the right to live their identities in public settings. I don't mean here public necessarily government settings, but public in the sense of civil society. Same-sex couples who were once wrongly told to keep their relationships in the closet now have the right to participate in the institution of civil marriage. They should also have full access to goods and services in the marketplace, including wedding goods. <coughs> But neither should religious believers be told to confine their beliefs to church. They likewise have strong interests in being able to pursue their livelihoods and run schools or social service organizations without having to violate their conscience. There's another interesting parallel between the claims to same-sex marriage and many religious freedom claims. Both to a significant extent claim a right to pursue activities that contribute not just to individual autonomy, <coughs> but to the common good. Marriage equality prevailed in the courts and public opinion, and here I'm echoing what's been said, uh, for many reasons, but among them, here I'm, here I'm echoing what's been said, uh, was that same-sex couples wanted to marry to pursue similar virtues as straight couples. Love, love commitment, and family. And the court held that same-sex relationships fit within the traditional right to marry because, among other things, marriage, quote, safeguards children and families, and many, say, this is still quoting from Justice Kennedy's opinion, many same-sex couples provide loving and nurturing homes to their children. There are other things uh, in the opinion that I think uh, express a sort of common good view of same-sex marriage, not just an individual autonomy view. But re religious organizations, too, claim religious freedom in order to be able to serve others in adoption, in education, in poverty and disaster relief, and so on. Freedom to serve is the title of the Catholic Bishop's Religious Freedom Campaign. These organizations are motivated by their religious identity to engage in these acts of service which are important in our society, and they want to be able to remain faithful to their identity while continuing to provide such service. So these parallels, if we recognize them, do provide a very broad, I think, common ground between gay rights and, uh, and religious conservatives' rights. These parallels could generate some sympathy on each side, not necessarily for the other side's beliefs or actions, but for the predicament that each faces when subject to government restriction. That's my first point. Second, second point, of course, even if these two claims parallel each other, they nevertheless conflict. So what sort of standards protect both sides. We're not necessarily finding common ground on what, what the, the, the standard should be. We may have common ground in the sense of there's sympathy between, there are parallels between the two sides. There's still, you're going to have to draw a line before the rights come into tension with each other. Okay, so I'm, I'm following up here on people who are more directly involved in this. True, true protection for, for both sides would be for states to do what Utah did. Uh, and uh, enact non-discrimination legislation uh, while also protecting, meaning, uh, providing meaningful protection for religious objectors. And for the reasons Tyler uh, said, negotiation is in the interest of both sides. In 30 states, LGBT individuals have no statewide protection against being fired or denied service. Uh, in the states where they do have protection, uh, and in cities where they do have protection, the, the level of social disapproval that LGBT people face is less than in the states where they don't have protection. So protection is absent in the places where it's most needed. Uh, not saying it's not needed in, in blue states, but it's, it's, it's needed less there than in, in purple states where you could, might possibly have it where it's more needed. Uh, and relig including religious exemptions in non-discrimination legislation would make it easier to pass 
in several states and at the federal level. And yet, uh, a number of the major gay rights groups uh, have withdrawn any uh, support for any exemption beyond the narrow case of employment. Uh, <coughs> I agree with, with Tyler then on the, that being so, it's just in pragmatic terms a misguided uh, position to take. Uh, religious conservatives across the nation are likewise uh, acting in misguided ways in resisting protection for both sides because they continue to face a ticking demographic time bomb. Not only do most Americans now support same-sex rights, uh, same-sex marriage rights, but each genera uh, successive generation supports them more strongly and will become increasingly inclined to dismiss religious liberty as a cover for bigotry. So if conservatives refuse gay rights laws and exemptions now, they will likely be stuck with gay rights laws and no exemptions later. Uh, now, with respect to the scope of exemptions, uh, that's the kind of thing that has to be decided in a, in a, in a, a no negotiation. Uh, uh, I do think that with respect to religious organizations, uh, colleges and other religious organizations, the presence of alternative providers in most cases makes it possible to protect religious organizations without significantly cutting into access to education, to adoption, and so on. Religious providers can reach the segment of the population that wants services in a religious setting, while other providers uh, reach, uh, serve, uh, reach different segments. Uh, so I was going to say a little bit more about the California bill, but we're running out of, out of, out of time. Uh, the California proposed bill that would have threatened uh, religious colleges in the state with the loss of uh, state grants for their students uh, was a um, almost moral threat to the religious colleges in California uh, over uh, some cases of enforcing standard conduct against uh, standards of conduct against LGBT students. Uh, those kinds of situations uh, are distressing and disturbing sometimes the way they work out. But on balance, LGBT students have many other options besides the religious colleges, uh, the, the conservative religious colleges. There are difficult questions about what happens with someone who is transitioning during the time that a, a goes to a Christian college and, and either just, you know, discovering their sexual orientation, becoming more firm about it, or transitioning. Uh, there may be some creative solutions for Christian colleges to help those students, including easing transfer uh, requirements and so on, to, uh, so that students don't lose time and, and, and resources if they feel they need to transfer. So there, these, are, these are complications, uh, but, uh, but on the whole, uh, it's, it's very possible in this sort of situation, given the wide no number of alternative providers, to protect both rights. In the commercial sphere, protections for refusal of service need to be narrow or and carefully defined. There's a strong interest in ensuring that all people have ready access to goods and services without being uh, regularly rejected. Uh, and commercial businesses don't give notice of their nature in the way that religious organizations do. Uh, but I still would recognize the right to refuse in a, in a limited class of those uh, commercial cases, small personalized businesses that uh, conscientiously object to providing goods and services uh, directly to a marriage to which they object. I think that even if if you read Mass, I'm going to disagree with Bill a little bit. I think even if you read Masterpiece uh, Cake Shop as uh, being about more than just an instance of hostile statements expressed by the Commission, that is, if you if you look uh, if, if if you say that there was an expressive element uh, here, uh, I don't think that that's that's going to undermine civil rights laws um, broadly. At the very least, in this case, we had other bakers who had been allowed to refuse a cake on very much the other side of this divided issue. They, uh, Colorado had allowed other bakers to refuse uh, a cake with an anti-gay express statement on it. And that's, I think, 
relatively uncontroversial. Uh, but uh, Jack Phillips was not given the same ability to refuse to serve not the same sex couple in general because he made cakes for, uh, for or he was willing to make cakes for same sex couples, uh, but uh, a cake for the wedding in, in particular, which uh, is, uh, I, I think, an inherently celebratory uh, uh, thing to produce. Um, so I'm going to leave a little time for questions here. So uh, I, I, I was going to say a little bit about master, uh, other things about what masterpiece means. So, uh, but I think I'll, I think I'll pass over. Uh, well, I'll just say very briefly. If masterpiece is a case just about particular statements expressing hostility made by the commissioners in Colorado in that case. One of them, for example, made a comparison between Phillips's, Jack Phillips's belief and uh, religious defenses of slavery and the Holocaust. Uh, the Supreme Court said that these commissioners who were not all, who were acting both in a way as prosecutors in the case and as adjudicators of the case, they were the ones deciding the case as well as bringing the suit against him. That, that in that context, when they are adjudicating the case, uh, evidence of bias is particularly uh, important uh, and is enough to, uh, to reverse uh, the judgment against him. Uh, this is not really relevant to the gay rights uh, uh, and religious freedom issue, but it would be quite interesting to see what, hap what the Supreme Court does with the statements of our president uh, against Muslims in the travel ban case, which were far more explicit and uh, uh, and blatant in uh, that even the commissioner's statements in Masterpiece, which I think were still pretty blatant, uh, the uh, one set of hostile statements does not excuse uh, another. And uh, again, part of our, our problem here is that uh, in uh, the countries that we don't, uh, uh, too many people in the, in the polarized groups don't want to give the same sort of regard uh, to, uh, to other groups that they claim for those that they're uh, sympathetic to. Um, but beyond that, it's uh, really not clear how much a uh, masterpiece means because the court uh, put its toe in the water quite gingerly and uh, did not decide the underlying uh, question. So I think there are still a lot of things left unresolved uh, after the, uh, the masterpiece case. Um, the uh, the, uh, the 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 masterpiece in particular turned on the the fact of state of a finding of state hostility and the fact that the state had treated these other bakers' uh, refusal differently. It had protected their refusal and not protected Jack Phillips. Now, if the state doesn't do that, if it doesn't treat the two cases inconsistently, then there's not going to be a First Amendment argument that can get off the ground. Objectors in that situation will have to rely on uh, state religious freedom statutes, the counterparts to the federal RIPRA statute, or state constitutions. Uh, but those cases will still pose the lar larger issue, uh, whether conscientious objectors to same-sex weddings should be uh, protected uh, in that defined situation. And I do think they, they should be uh, protected. This will be one of the hardest things to get over in the negotiations, uh, but when the business is small and personal and al alternative providers exist, uh, as they nearly always do, uh, I, I do believe they should be uh, protected. Uh, without such an exemption, conscientious objectors like Jack Phillips must permanently surrender either their conscience or their occupation. A narrow exception to gay rights laws in that religiously significant context with, uh, in, uh, of intense importance to the religious objectors holds the best hope of protecting it, uh, both sides if we combine that with, uh, with anti-discrimination laws in most cases. I'm not hopeful that we'll choose the option of protecting both times, sides anytime soon. There are many reasons why Utah is hard to replicate. The uh, influence of the LDS Church in Utah, the positive influence of the LDS Church, is, uh, I would, is unique in the United States. 
Utah also had features of its uh, pre-existing anti-discrimination laws uh, that meant that you didn't have to do anything really different uh, with respect to sexual orientation. And it is a, a, a sort of an article, a premise of the major gay rights groups that you cannot treat sexual orientation differently than race discrimination. And that's a real hurdle to get, uh, to get over. Uh, but the option is always there. Thank you. Well, I'm going to urge you all to be here uh, exactly on time tomorrow morning so that we can uh, begin and stay on schedule uh, tomorrow. And in return for that, uh, I'd like to uh, have you uh, have us finish uh, on time as well. Uh, that said, I do want to uh, just open the floor, uh, take one or two questions together, and then give each of our panelists an opportunity to have about a minute for uh, final reflections. Are there a couple people who have questions that they'd like to ask? We have microphones. Uh, let's start here. Uh, could you please uh, identify yourself and stand? Uh, we're on Facebook Live, and so we'd like to uh, be able to uh, let the people who are listening in be aware. My name is Erica Munson, and I represent a group called Mormons Building Bridges, which is an LGBTQ support organization for Mormons. And my question is, I guess maybe mostly to Tyler, I understand that um, balancing religious freedom with LGBTQ rights is how the law works. These are the, the questions we have to ask. But when the court cases are done, even when it ends in a mutually really beneficial way, like the Utah legislation, um, I feel like the, the um, opposition of these groups is reinforced. And so we still come away with a, you're either in the religion camp or the LGBTQ camp. And my experience in Mormondom is that there are so many people that are in both camps. And so Tyler, I may be wondering, do you have any suggestions as how to get, once the the legal work is done, how to, how to help the culture come together. All right, uh, great question. Is there one more person who has a question that uh, they'd like to ask? All right, well, um, oh, there, is, there is a hand uh, uh, right there. Uh, could you put your hand back up so the microphone can see you? Yeah, my question is about the, uh, the common ground aspect of the presentation. Um, the sense I got from across the panel is that there are certain norms that are already held in common by everyone up there and what I'm asking is how does this, what does this have to do with the people who don't share those norms? In other words, if you don't think that the normalization of sexual acts outside the context of a man and a woman in, in, in faithful marriage is a good idea or something that, that society should foster. If you don't believe that the difference between a, a categorically reproductive union of a man and a woman versus a categorically non-reproductive uh, union of a man and a man or a woman, a woman is a matter of indifference. Or if you don't believe that um, one sex is malleable and the transition is a real phenomenon, how, that's, there's, a, there's a sizable population of people that fit in that category. Are they just said, well, you, your views, sorry, that bus has left, you're out, or is there some way of bringing them in as well? Okay, uh, let's uh, respond in the order that we initially spoke, and uh, we'll just give each of our panelists an opportunity to reflect both on what you heard from the other panelists, uh, any final c comments, and responsive to the two questions. I will respond to the second question as part of what I was thinking about for, as you mentioned, kind of a closing remark. Um, I think that the question that you asked is, is very insightful because it does um, reflect what is one of the big misunderstandings, I think, in how we think about these topics, which is if I disagree, then I must support laws that affirm my beliefs as opposed to I must support laws that affirm the right for me to hold my beliefs. 
And I think that is what I think I, I observe within kind of Protestant evangelical Christianity is, is we're working through all of this um, as you know, interfaith movements or multi-faith movements are coming around um, trying to figure out how can we work together, which is this idea that if we work with people who disagree with us or if we support laws that preserve rights for people who we disagree with on whether it's this particular issue or religion generally, et cetera, that somehow we're watering down our beliefs as a particular person, political, religious, et cetera. And I think that instead, coming at it from the perspective and championing the perspective that actually when you hold beliefs very strongly, when you're very confident in what you believe, that actually can be a, a particularly from religious beliefs, particularly from Christian religious beliefs, that actually our beliefs can actually be the foundation or the springboard from which we can then engage others confidently exhibit kindness, advocate for our neighbor for their basic rights under the law in these areas we've been talking about, housing, employment, uh, access to, you know, the, those being the two most kind of uh, sustainability, but also financial credit, jury duty service, etc. But that actually we can do those things because of what we believe, not in spite of them. So we can say, because I'm a Christian, I believe that my LGBT neighbor should be able to have housing and not be kicked out when they're transitioning. Or because I'm a Christian, I believe that I have these rights and that I want the right to hold my beliefs about the very things you mentioned, but to also create space and law for people who disagree with me. All right, thank you, Shabrina. Uh, Tyler? Yeah, I, um, I'm struggling with the first question because there is no easy answer. I think that the answer to the second question might be a little easier for me at least, which is that I don't think that protecting a gay person from employment discrimination means that we think that it's necessarily an endorsement of them being gay. I think it's an endorsement that they shouldn't just lose their job just because they're gay. I think even if we were to all agree right now that gay people choose to be gay, you could still find agreement that they shouldn't be fired for that choice, any more than somebody should be fired maybe because they've chosen a certain religion to follow. And so I think that that's, that would be my question back is, why does it have to be assumed that because we're pre protecting people against employment discrimination, housing discrimination, or what have you, that we're endorsing the rest of their lifestyle? And I think that the same is true of an employer or a landlord that them leasing their space or employing someone doesn't mean that they agree with all of the choices that they do or that they agree with what they do when they go home at night um, or all the other personal choices that they make. So I think it's just creating a protection for some that I do happen to believe people are born gay and transgender and that it, it creates a comfort zone for them to go about their lives and does not interfere with the preachings and the teachings of people who would disagree. And I think it's then it's finding that to make it clear that it should not interfere with the preachings and the teachings and the exercises of those institutions because if it did interfere with that, that would be a problem. But if we're talking about these other sorts of basic civil rights protections, then I think that we can still continue to argue the theology of sexuality and gender and family, which are very important conversations. And I think that it's actually something that we're losing right now that Bill almost alluded to, which is just the concept of marriage itself. And that maybe there's some kind of a new burgeoning coalition of people who are pro-marriage. Maybe it's traditional couples, maybe it's same-sex couples, but who are pro-marriage, who are pro-family, who are pro-adoption, and so on, who can come together from very different backgrounds, but to support that sort of an institution. So that was probably too long, but I do want to say, I think the, the, the first question from the lady from Building Bridges all I could say is to point to the Equality Utah model, that their board of directors has Republicans and Democrats, it has Mormons, it has Catholics, it has Jews, it has atheists, uh, it has a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds on the board. They're raising money from lots of different sources. They are invested in, and, and I only alluded to it, I, I appreciate that Bill went more specifically into the work that Equality Utah continued to do with Senator Adams to repeal the no promo homo law. That's the sort of stuff that is going to continue to change the culture 
And I think it boils down to the, the comments, honestly, that our religious leaders and our civic leaders are making. And I would love to see more denominations, more religious groups around the country and around the world speak up the way that LDS leaders have, because that's created a whole new structure, I think, within the LDS community that younger people see and they hear their leaders speaking. I don't know if everybody would have seen Senator Hatch's speech on the Senate floor, but I wish that they would. And I don't think it's a surprise that it is Senator Hatch who's the one who gave, who's really the first Republican in Congress to give a speech affirming LGBT youth and talking about LGBT youth suicide. And so that culture change and the legal change, the political change, it all goes hand in hand. And I, I haven't sensed there's, there's any idea that passing this law means it's the end of the work. And just really quickly, I mean, just, just one example. You can support laws against religious discrimination without thereby agreeing with other religions. You could think that there's, there's not really any commonality between various, various religions. You don't need to be an ecumenicist uh, on that question. And yet, nevertheless, you can, and, and many people do, support laws against religious discrimination on the ground of sort of the importance of that of the religion in the person's life. So I think there's another analogy there. All right, and final word to Professor Eskridge. Yeah, I don't think there is an easy answer to your question, sir. I think it's a deep question, and it goes to a deep division in American society, and it goes to understanding religious points of view. I think it's wrong to look at religion, religious points of view, monotonically. There are many religious Americans particularly in the South where I grew up, their view of religion is that it saturates everything they do every day, including any collaboration. And they see it as a violation of religion, not the wedding cake thing, making a wedding cake. Yeah, sure. But they view having to serve lesbian and gay customers at a restaurant to be a religious affront to the way they understand religion. And you're not solving that by ignoring it, okay? Uh, and I might add that if you're a liberal, uh, you might consider this thought experiment. Uh, and that is that if you were opposed to the death penalty uh, and you made a certain drug you know, that was very helpful for people, uh, and the governor of the state came and said, uh, we need this drug because this is the only way we can execute people now, would you sell the governor that drug? A lot of liberals would not. So this is not just a religious thing. Uh, this is psychologically very deep. And I will insist you do not solve deep psychological problems by pretending they don't exist. So I think this is going to be a source of continual division. Uh, now, I agree with Tyler in terms of the ways going forward. I think common projects are the ways going forward. Look at uh, how President Trump has united us on the uh, issue of children <laughs> being put in cages. I'm not kidding. Uh, uh, being put in cages. Honestly, I think the humane treatment of children, and forget about who's doing what, I think the humane treatment of children uh, and the interests of children, whether it's in the immigration area, whether it's in the teen suicide area, whether it's in good educational programs area, this is an enterprise that everybody ought to be able to agree about. And I think it would behoove LGBT groups as well as religious groups to make common cause on very specific issues and also very general issues, such as this. And this is the only way to bridge the kind of deeper divide the gentleman was asking about. And I don't think it's a panacea. Uh, so I think uh, we have a Trump moment that ought to allow us, not just on this issue of caging children, to, to reaffirm an important American norm, but maybe use that moment to think about other opportunities in, in state and local and whatnot, where uh, the most vulnerable people in our society can receive our sustained attention, cutting across parties, religions, orientations, and, and all of that. All right, well, I broke my promise and I've kept you five minutes over. I still want you on time tomorrow morning, so I apologize for that.
let me uh, close by asking you to join me in expressing appreciation to our uh, students.